Today, our subject for this morning is the place of fathers. Hallelujah. The place of fathers. And I want to wish all the men in this house a happy Father's Day. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, uh, the, we don't celebrate. It's, it's, not a good, it's not a good thing. Can we put our hands together and celebrate God? For fathers, hallelujah. Uh, for fathers. Um, I realize that the way we relate to fathers determines the way we relate to God. You, you don't rise above the way you relate to a father. You know, you don't rise above that. It's like a rate limiting step in your life. And anyone who doesn't have a proper relationship with their earthly father. Usually there's, there's a problem with their heavenly father. Because earthly fathers are just examples of our heavenly father. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there are some pretty bad fathers out there. There are some pretty bad examples out there. But also, in the midst of that example, there are people who just exist as bad examples. Like, this is how not to live. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, if you go this way, you end up like them. So, even for bad examples, they are examples nonetheless. The place of fathers. And it has become very crucial we talk about something like this because the institution of fatherhood is under so much attack. It's under so much attack and we don't even realize it. The men are under attack. The institution is under attack. And we are all oblivious about what's happening. And that's because of the prophetic place of fathers in this world. The prophetic place. Now, I pray the mothers are not offended because we we'll talk about mothers, hallelujah. But today we are, we are talking about the fathers, hallelujah. We'll take a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 15. And he says that, he says that, for though you might have 10,000 instructors or guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. And that's where I want you to understand that there are many people who teach you many things on life's journey. There are many pastors who teach you from afar, from close. There are books that will be written. There are messages on YouTube. And they are instructors. Let me tell you something. Anyone who doesn't know you is not your father. <laughs> Should I say it again? Because uh, many people like the idea of a great person being their father. But that's not how God made it to. Everybody would have loved that maybe the, the queen of England is, is your mother. But that's not how God made it. People didn't become mothers or fathers based on their qualifications or based on their accomplishments or achievements. No. There is nothing like someone is your mother and they don't know you. No. They know you. And you know them. There are exceptions, of course. There are people who gave birth and ran away. That, that, that's a bad example. But typically, you cannot be someone's child and they don't know you. The person at best is an instructor. And many of us are instructors about fathers. You know, just because an apostle somewhere is great doesn't make them your father. Just because you go on YouTube and listen to their messages doesn't make them your father. Or just because they've accomplished something great and they, and they are working in the supernatural and they are spiritual and they are whatever doesn't make them your father. And Paul was saying this to the church at Corinth. That you have many instructors and there will be many instructors on your journey. There will be many people who will teach you many things. There will be people who will pour in your life. There will be people who will do things for you. But you have few fathers. And why do we even say few fathers? I thought everyone has one father, right? Everyone here would have one father. Anytime we are not sure, it means that there's a problem, hallelujah. You know, that everyone will have one. 
Not two, not three, not four. One father. But you see, one father doesn't have the ability to supply everything a child needs. And that's why some people are disappointed in, in their fathers because they expected their fathers to be something they couldn't live up to. And that's the defect in earthly parenting. You know, your, your father cannot be everything to you. So sometimes, something you lack from a father, someone else will provide. God will bring people, other fathers on your journey. And who is a father? The word father from the Greek, you know, is, is Abba. In fact, Hebrew, Abba, which means source. You know, the source of something. So your source, what's your source? This shirt I'm wearing was made out of a fabric. The, the, the dress came out of something. And fathers are supposed to be the source of something. Fathers, anytime you see a human being in a, in a realm, someone made them exist in that realm. It means that without that person, you would not have existed in this world without a father. So there are realms you cannot exist in without fathers. So yes, you would have a biological father, someone who calls you to exist in this world. And then you would have spiritual fathers. Now I address the scripture that said that call no one father. And there are people who, you know, go along that tangent and say Jesus Christ said call no one father. But the same Jesus Christ said call no one rabbi. But they called Jesus rabbi when he was on earth. And he himself, he called also the rabbi when he was on earth. So you must, when it comes to scripture, you must look at the context in which something was being said to understand what was said. You have many instructors. You need to clearly distinguish between who an instructor is and who a, who a father is because your relationship with them is not the same. In this world, there will be many relationships in your life. No two of them are the same. The relationship you have with your mother is not the relationship you have with your father. The relationship you have with your father is not the relationship you have with your classmates. The relationship you have with your classmates is not the relationship you have with your husband. The, one of the problems we are having in our day is because people want to treat all relationships the same. One of the wisest things you ever learn, you know, it said the, the wisdom of zoo keeping or the wisdom of keeping a zoo. You don't treat the antelope the same way you treat the ants. And you don't treat the ants the same way you treat the lion. You don't treat the lion the same way you treat the monkey. You don't feed them the, the same way. It doesn't mean you don't respect them, but you relate to them differently. So if you don't understand what the relationship is, you cannot appropriately, you know, walk in wisdom when it comes to that relationship. You have many instructors. Know them. Who is an instructor? And who is a father? Because their role in your life is different. The teachers who taught you in primary school, their role in your life is different from your father who sent you to that school. In fact, your father or your mother sent you to your instructors. But it does not mean your father is your instructor. You know, your father can instruct, but it does not mean your father is the same as your instructors. Please, I don't know whether you are getting me. In the course of your father's duties, he may instruct you, he may lead you, he may guide you. But then also know the place of people who are called teachers or instructors on your journey. Let me finish this scripture and then we'll say a few more things. For though you might have 10,000 guardians or instructors, you do not have many fathers. Indeed, in Christ Jesus, I have become your father through the gospel. There are people who would become what we call spiritual fathers. And, and I know many people here don't like hearing spiritual father because of the way it has been abused. But just because something is abused doesn't mean the thing doesn't have its place. Just because a pastor somewhere abused a church member doesn't mean there is no place for, I don't know whether, whether you are getting me. And the devil will use the weaknesses that exist, you know, to make something look bad which is not supposed to be bad. So now that pastors who have spent other people's offering, does it mean offerings are bad? Does it mean tithes are bad? Does it mean sacrificial offerings are bad? Just because people are causing a mess out there, doesn't mean a whole institution is wrong. Are there quack doctors out there? 
Does it mean there are no genuine doctors? No. Are there quack nurses out there? Yes. Does it mean there are no genuine nurses? No. What, what, what I want you to understand is that don't allow the devil to demonize the whole institution because of the weaknesses that exist in it. And Paul is writing to this church and said, I have become your father through the gospel. Why is that important? It's because until you can accept someone as a father, you will not accept their instruction, you will not accept their guidance. See, I know my mother has my best interest. So when she's telling me something, I know it is in my interest. I don't know whether you are getting me. You, I cannot take the instruction of someone I met on the street because I'm not sure what your motives are. So it's important the church goes back to a place where we accept people as fathers. What does it mean if someone is a father? I'm not talking about people who you worship, people who make you lie down for them to work on you and things like that. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But Paul is saying that through the gospel I have preached to you, I have begotten you. In other words, I have caused you to exist in a realm spiritually that you wouldn't have existed in. And the devil is fighting the, the office of the pastor because, and there are some pretty bad pastors out there. Me, now when I go out and I see some things happening, I said, oh God, save us. There are bad examples, uh, examples out there. But I want you in your own life, and I'm not talking about only pastors as your fathers. Today, my focus will actually be on your biological father. Please, I hope you are getting what I'm saying. But I also want to give you an example because there is a place for fathers in you finding your place in this life. There's a place. I have begotten you through the gospel. I have brought you to a certain place through the words I've spoken to you. And I want to tell everyone here that you see the preachings, the teachings, and you come into a place like this. You have to make sure the relationship is functional. Yeah, if you're in a church, it is your responsibility to make sure there's a functioning relationship between you and your pastor or between you and the leaders God has placed over your life. It's your responsibility. And you cannot neglect an important relationship like the relationship between you and someone who has caused you to exist spiritually. Now you see, when Jesus was speaking about call no one father in Matthew chapter 23, it was because the scribes, the Sahindri, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, you know, they assumed certain positions of authority and they were abusing the people. They were abusing the people they were leading. And God was saying, now listen, if you look at these people, your idea of fatherhood will be deranged. We only have one father and he's the father in heaven. He is like the example of what fatherhood is. He is the epitome of fatherhood. If you want to know what fatherhood is, if you look at these Pharisees and Sadducees and what they are doing with you, calling you your fathers, then you will now have a bad relationship with God because in your relationship with God, you will think he is a bad person. You think he has bad motives for you. And as I say, call no one father. Call no one rabbi. Because people will now tell you, I'm your rabbi, I'm your teacher. And then with that, they abuse you. They take advantage of you. They spend your money. They miss so he said, listen, don't call anybody father. Only God is his father. So it was in that context of abuse in relationships that Jesus was telling them that all of you look up. Look up to heaven. When you want to find for any, I, I, I don't have my father alive today. Does it mean there's no hope for me? No. God will send other people on your journey to provide what that man would have provided. And there are some of you who have your parents alive, who have your fathers alive, who couldn't provide what you needed. But God brought other people your way who provided it. So instead of you being cynical and angry that that particular man didn't provide it, the same God who gave you him gave you other people to provide things he couldn't provide. So those who are hurt, those who are hung angry and those who feel like Gabriel is my father. Gabriel couldn't send me to MIT. Gabriel couldn't make sure I go to ABC. At the end of the day, you still made it to the destination because your heavenly father brought other people on the journey to supply what that earthly father couldn't supply. Some of your earthly fathers never sent you to church. 
But somehow God provided people on your journey who still made sure you were saved. So instead of being hurt, you have to look up to heaven and say, God, thank you. Because all you are looking for is not going to be in one man. You call father. Yes, some people will have very good fathers. But for those who are disappointed, I want to tell you that no one will be left without a father figure that God has intentionally put on your journey to help you, to guide you. Some, some, some of them may even be a bit distant, but I'm telling you because there are many of the close-up relationships that God will bring your way that you must learn to honor. You must learn, you must feed. And I realize that many people don't feed relationships. I have to address this as your pastor. Even here in the Edify Church. Many people don't feed relationships. But they want to benefit from relationships. There are people who come to church once. Then the next time you hear of them, they want a favor. They want you to pay school fees. You don't know. See, to be honest with you, some of the most committed people here, they don't ask for anything. They don't, I don't know whether you are getting me. They, they've not asked me anything in 10 years that I've known them. And there are people, they meet someone today, they, today no, they want to build a person. Oh, please, can you do me a favor? I'm not saying that people can't help people. People can help people. But stop expecting returns from relationships you've not invested in. You must consciously invest in some relationships. Me, I honor my fathers. This morning, I woke up at dawn. I was in Pastor Otterbell's office by six. The, the reason why it is right <laughs> is because I have to be your example. I honor people. I feed into relationships. Hello, sir. I'm just saying hi. Hope you are doing well. And I'll be teaching you the proper way to relate to fathers. Some of you are sitting here. The only time you talk to your father is when you need money. That's an evil generation. Oh, you didn't hear what I'm saying. Or when you need something. We should close from church and some of you would call your father and say thank you. Not because there is a need, but because it is right. Those of you whose fathers haven't given you money, the next time you write an exam and you get distinction, know that, you do know we all go to the same class, the same lecturer teaches us, but our IQs are different. Where do you think you got that from? Money is one of the least things we get from fathers. I'm telling you, money and physical things, they are important and they have their place. But some of you, without effort, you have something. Some of you, without effort, you are fresh. I don't know whether you are getting me. No, what, what special thing did you do, Martin, to be this tall? And how much money can anyone pay to get your height? I don't know whether you are getting me. So before you open your mouth and talk against a father, know that you receive things from him that money couldn't have bought. I'm telling you. Yeah. Before every comes to say anything, your dimples came from somewhere. They're not beautiful for nothing. You came from, the set of genes you had came from a place. And some of you went through certain schools. You wrote exams and passed. And you don't know that it came from somewhere. You didn't go to the boutique in heaven and say, give me lalas. Like Maoli. Maoli will go to the boutique in heaven and say, God. You see the, you see how, people, they are fresh. Oh. Fresh. Like anise. You know? You got it from somewhere. I'm not saying fathers shouldn't do what is, they are supposed to do. But I'm also telling you, especially those who didn't get everything they are supposed to get, that sometimes if you look beyond, you see the silver lining. What did you do to look this good? What did you do to be smart? What, no, what did you do to have the complexion you had? What did you do? You got it from somewhere. And I pray for us that we'll really see that, see, many of the things we are working for Many of the things we are struggling to get, it's like the addition of the foundation because we've all been given certain foundations. The place of fathers. They cause men and women to exist in realms that they wouldn't have existed in. Pastor Christopher wouldn't be in this world if not for a father. I wouldn't be in this world if not for a father. That's my physical, biological fathers. 
Then when you come to spiritual fathers, without their words, without their teachings, there are realms you will not exist in. Now let me tell you this. Before you tell me that, oh God Almighty, you go to the book of Acts. An angel appeared to Cornelius. What did he tell Cornelius? Send men to Joppa to go for, and call who? Peter. And he would come and tell you the things you must do to be saved. When Jesus appeared to Saul on the way to Damascus, what did he tell him? Go to the city. There's a disciple called Ananias. He will tell you the things you must do to be saved. Why couldn't Jesus directly instruct Paul the things he needed to do to be saved? And he had to send him to a man. In this world, God has given men. Today we are talking about fathers. God has given men the ability to cause you to exist in realms you would have never existed in. I'm telling you. Jo you know, uh, Cornelius was praying, praying, praying. Why couldn't God answer him directly? And God said, go and call for, send men to Joppa to call for Peter. And Peter is going to tell you the things you must do to be saved, you and your household. It means that God will go through certain men to bless your life, especially fathers. So you need to be very careful. You know, when I was going to marry, at the time my dad was alive, he told me something and there were some issues at the time. My father told me that in this life, there are many setbacks and many hurdles. You will need many blessings. So make sure you have the, as many blessings as you can go with. There are some people when they say, my son, bless you. It is more than three revivals put together. He said there are many challenges on this journey. So make sure you have many blessings. Don't go and marry someone you say for love against their parents' wisdom. The best you can do is to pray and God can touch the heart of any man or woman. If God refuses to touch your heart, don't elope to Dubai with someone's daughter because you are in love. You are not wise. I don't know whether you are getting me. Sometimes God will use the difficult, you know how difficult some parents are to separate you from some people you thought would be good to you. I'm telling you, sometimes. But at the end of the day, pray for his will all the time. Pray for his will. You know, so Paul said, I have begotten you by the gospel. So we have father by birth. I've already spoken about it. Then we have fathers by adoption. I mean, legally, you can adopt someone and be their father, physical father. There are many children from Osu Children's Home People go adopt and they become their fathers. And this adoption thing has been there before, way before. It's not like our recent time. Adoption has been a big part of the Roman Empire. Many of the empires that existed, they actually use adoption than biological sons and daughters. Why? Because sometimes your own children won't be correct. Sometimes your own children don't look for your interest. Sometimes another person would be more loyal to you. Another person would even see you as a great person and your own children. So in their time, they, they, they adopted sons who became next kings. Because now when you look in the family, there's no correct person to, <laughs> to take on the throne. So it was allowed for a king to adopt a son, disciple or mentor that son, till that son takes over the throne. So there are fathers by adoption. And then there are spiritual fathers. And all of them have their place in your life. Your physical father has their place. Many of them, the assignment was done when you arrived here. Hallelujah. I'm saying the assignment was done when, what? You arrived there. But their responsibility is also to provide security. It's to guard you against many things. It's to provide what we call like a head. Now, human beings are defective in many ways. So I'm not saying that a human being has the ability to do all that. We are all looking at what God is to us as a template of what fathers must be. And the man here, if you are going to be someone's father, if you are going to be someone's father, know that there are responsibilities that are put on you. You are going to mirror the place of God in another person's life. You are going to be another person's champion. You are going to be another person's hero. Yes, you would have your weaknesses, you have your defects, but generally, you represent God in that person's life. Hey, hallelujah. Now, I want us to take a scripture from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5. Malachi 4, verse 5. He says that, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. One of the things the devil is doing is to make the hearts of fathers depart from their children. There are some children, by the way they have, they have lived, their fathers have disowned them. Their fathers
Jesus wants to associate with these men. And then there are some children too who don't want to associate with their fathers because of the way their fathers have lived. I don't know whether you are getting me. The way their fathers have lived. So you realize that the heart of the, the son or daughter is not with the father. And God said that I am sending Elijah ahead. And in many ways it's John the Baptist. To come and prepare the hearts of the sons. And turn their hearts towards the fathers. And turn the hearts of God. You see, in your journey, God will send many people to turn your hearts back to fathers. They are on assignment because usually a curse comes up when there are no fathers. Do you know that as much as 60% of those in prison grew up in home without fathers? Do you know that? In any prison anywhere, many of the people came from homes where there are no fathers. Because you see, a woman's love nurtures a child. Yes. But a child needs more than nurturing. A woman's love is nature, grow, tender. And a child needs that kind of love. But a child also needs tough love. The love that won't allow you to mess up yourself. The love that won't... I'm not saying a woman's love... <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't, don't say what I'm not saying. I'm just saying that generally men represent tough love. And it is needed if we don't do that in some states as high as 80% of those in prison for murder for crimes came from homes where there were no fathers. And so the devil would make sure families would come up without fathers. I pray for you, hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. I pray for you that whether you are a man or you are a woman, there will be a strong man in your life, hallelujah. Both men and women need men in their lives. And you see, every man needs a woman and every woman needs a man. And every man needs a man and every woman needs a woman. But they play different roles. And God is saying that I'm sending someone to turn your heart back to your father. Listen, some of you should sit down with your fathers and have conversations with them. I'm telling you, even the ones who you think have made mistakes and have done blah, 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 sit down. You learn. Learn to ask, you know, my, my father, even if I want to ask him a question, I don't have the opportunity because he's not here. Those of you whose parents are alive, don't allow anything you think your father has done prevent you from sitting down with them and hearing their wisdom. I'm telling you. Even the, the things you think you know, you don't know. I have a friend who said, I never spoke to my father till he died because of the way he treated my mom. Blah, 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 blah. He said so. This year, earlier, earlier this year, he said, hey, my father is a great man. Why? He said, after my father died, dealing with my mother is an impossible thing. How did he live with that woman for 40 years? You don't get it. And I also know a father who said, listen, your mom was a great mother, but a bad wife. Do you know there are two different things? Some of you, your mothers gave you everything you needed. They were there for you. They nurtured you. They gave you food. They sacrificed. Good mother is different from good wife. So you are judging your father based on what you thought made him bad. I'm saying that even for those who are bad, sit with them. Ask hard questions. Tell them you are, you are hurt. I don't know whether you are getting me. But learn wisdom from their life, from their mistakes. Listen, it was when my father died and I was writing my mom's uh, tribute to him that I realized that there were many things I didn't know. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, there were many things I didn't know. And I pray that many of you won't become like me. When my mother was dictating to me how their journey started, he said, I was in front of the ADB bank when your father brought his car. Yes, that's where we met. 1970-something. Yeah, in front of ADB. And he was the managing director of this company. Listen, your, your ma I had a driver. Yeah, she had a driver. 19, what? Even till today, some of you, it's only by the grace of God that you will have. You know, you don't even have your own car to say you have a driver. You see, by the time your parents were in love before you were born, do you get what I'm saying? There were many things you didn't see with your eyes. And there will, there will be many, things, many stories that you will never hear. There are some things that, see, I knew and, and today I'm talking about fathers. So that, that some of you would think you know. One man told his son that, listen, 
You will one day have an opportunity to love a woman. Do it and let's see. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> he said, one day, you have an opportunity to do what you think I couldn't do. Do it. And let's see. Never move a father there. Because this was a man who was begging for forgiveness. The guy said, nah. We will be champion fathers. Yes. I knew a man. I mean, see, one of the things I'm so interested in is fathers. Yes, I'm very interested in them. Because by the day, many of the things my father has said are coming to pass. They are happening. It's like he's a prophet. They are happening. The things he said, they are happening. After his death. So I pray for you. And those whose fathers have made it difficult for you to relate. And I know, I'm not saying that everybody has this mood. There are some fathers who have made it difficult for their children to relate with them. Those who are in places like that, I pray for grace for you. I pray for grace for you. The grace that comforts your heart. You know, I know people whose fathers raped them. Those are extremes. Like, you get me? Sometimes if we have this conversation, people will say, so we don't know what you are talking about. Yes. There are bad examples. There are people who can't say the kind of things their fathers did to them. But we are saying that somehow it was from the wisdom of God for you to still come from there. And I pray that where those bad examples exist, we will receive grace to live better. Oh, you didn't, I, I, you didn't hear what I'm saying. I'm saying that instead of talking about things you didn't understand, a friend of mine said, the father never liked the mother and would neglect her. Said they were even living in two different rooms until uh, the man died. When the man died, blah, blah, blah. He, he was so bitter, he never forgave the dad. One day, the mom sat him down. He said, listen, I cheated in my marriage. And it didn't stop. Do you get what I'm saying? It didn't stop. That man was acting that way because it was not like something happened. And he, there was a man who I couldn't let go of till the day your father died. So some of you who think you are wise, you think say you're wise. There are stories you will never know, I tell you. And there are things that people haven't told you. How many people have gone through things you've not told anyone? But everybody on the outside can think anything, but you may not know what puts the person in that position. He said, I couldn't let go till your father died. So when you see him unhappy at home and he's sleeping in another room, he kept on complaining. I, I, never, I never listened. Yes. I never listen. I mean, one of the things I'm so interested in is people's relationship with their fathers. If you are so close to me, eh, it will come up in one of our conversations. I tell you, the many of the people who, one of the things I always bring up is your father. I always bring it up because I realize that until that John the Baptist comes to turn the hearts of fathers to their sons or their daughters and the hearts of children to their fathers, the curse will continue. Someone has to break the case. Someone has to break the case. Uh, we, we don't know what our fathers will do. We don't know the decisions we, they will make. But we will act right. Yes, we'll do. we will honor them. Let them do whatever they want to do. We will honor them. Because the Bible says that lest I come to strike the earth with a case, let the hearts of the fathers be turned to their children. And the children's hearts to their fathers. Hey, hallelujah. Very quickly, I want us to, the devil is working over time to turn your heart away from father. I'm not only talking about physical, um, what's the name, parents or your biological parents. I'm talking about your spiritual parents. I'm talking about important people on your journey. And a father is not always someone who is old. Many people became fathers when they were young. I mean, I mean I'm a father. You God, I'm saying, I'm a father. I'm not an old person. When we say father, it doesn't mean the person is old. That's not what it means. Many people became father, fathers even in their 20s. So when you see someone at 60, it's not like they became fathers at 60. They were young when they became fathers. So when we say God will put fathers on your journey, stop looking out for old people. It's not always old people that God would put on your journey. Sometimes there will be a young person, but they represent something in your life. And you must be able to accept them. Hallelujah. You know, people by, 
by virtue of their relationships, they have certain things. All the tall buildings you see in town, it belongs to families too. There are people who, by virtue of being part of families, inheritance. And some, some of this, there's nothing. Do you got see? There's no inheritance anywhere. It shows you how important a father is. He said, when you go to New York, all those high-rising buildings, they belong to families. And people, by no effort of theirs, just by being someone's child, you have land in prime areas, in cities. By having the appropriate relationship with the fathers God will send your way, there will be things you have, not by labor, but by relationship. I don't know whether you are getting me. Someone became the Duke of London. How did they become the Duke of London? By academic, what's the name? You are learning overnight. No, 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 no. And the most important things of life, they come through relationships. Yes, children come from relationships. You can't put a tag on it. Human life comes through relationships. Hard work has its place, but the most important deals come from relationships. Who do presidents appoint uh, ministers and all that? Is it hardworking people in the country? Those they have relationships with. I'm not downplaying hard work. I'm just telling you that if you knew, you would take your relationship seriously. If you understand that very quickly, your relationships would be premium in your life. You would invest in relationships. You would invest in relationships. Now very quickly, Proverbs 19 verse 14. It says that houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers. Houses and, you know, riches. So it means that fathers give. And some people don't have any physical legacy, but they have a spiritual inheritance. I tell you, whatever it is, if you have a relationship with a father, what is available is something physical, which is like a physical inheritance, but there is also a spiritual inheritance that you have as a result of that relationship. Houses and riches are inheritance from fathers. I pray, I say a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That when it is, it is your turn, the men in this house, you will leave an inheritance for your children's children. Hallelujah. You will be an example for two generations at least in the name of Jesus. So very quickly, how to relate to a father? How to relate? Whether a physical father, a spiritual father, an adopted father, whatever form. How do you relate with a father? Number one, honor them. Honor. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. It says that, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So number one is to obey, right? Then number two, honor your father and mother. This is a commandment. You see, why would you make Anna a commandment? Why would you make Anna a commandment? Pastor Gabriel, please come. Please come. Why, why, would you, why would you, you know, why would I command him to do something? As I've called him now, didn't he come? I didn't have to say I command you to come. The only time you command people to do anything is when there is a likelihood they won't do it. Do you get what I'm saying? It's like, Ah, so for come. I knew you would come. So I didn't have to say, I command you to come. No. I, I, I hope you are getting the point. So anytime you see a commandment in the Bible, it means that this instruction, you are likely not going to do it. Yes. So there are many people who don't properly honor their fathers. And it's like at your default state, you don't honor well. Yeah, that's it. It's not, don't argue it. Don't say I'm not a bad person. We know you are not a bad person. But anywhere you see anything which is a commandment, it means that the day if we leave you by yourself, you won't do it. It is going to take a commandment for you to do it. Number two, anytime we command, it means that it is something you can do. I hope you are getting what I'm saying. I cannot command the chair to walk to me because the chair doesn't have the ability to walk. It will be an unreasonable command. So anytime you see Anna, it means that it is possible to honor your father. There was no preamble that honor your good fathers. Honor your mother and father. So it means that it is within your rights to honor. Hey, hallelujah. So as you are seated here, these two things are true. At your default state, you are not honoring. It's taking a commandment for you to do it. Number two, you have what it takes to do it. Also, please, thank you. Yes, thank you. So honor your mother and father. What is honor? 
Anna is deep respect. You see, and there's a difference between honor and respect. Because, you see, respect is end. Yes, when people do certain things, they achieve some things, they end your respect. When people behave a certain way, you know, they, they end your respect. You respect them because of what you have done. Anna, no, Anna is not end. Respect is end. Anna is given. I hope you are getting what I'm saying. You honor someone not because they've earned it. So those who are waiting to honor people because they've earned the honor, you are missing a greater part of the commandment. It's because respect would be because, hey, this person is the best student in our class. This man has achieved A, B, C, D. They've built a hundred churches and all that. Listen, most of your fathers won't build all these companies, all these churches, but still honor them. It's a command to honor. So honor is given, not because the person has done something worthy of it. I don't know whether you are getting me. I'm not, res- I'm not speaking to you with respect because you have even respected me. I'm doing it because I am giving it as a commandment which has been given to me. So Anna is given. Those of you who are waiting you know, for your parents to pay your school fees before you honor them, you've missed the point of Anna. You can respect them for doing what they were supposed to do. But even if they didn't do it, you can still give Anna. Hey, Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. So he said, obey your parents, right? Then he said, honor your father and your mother. So number two is to have an eye that honest. You see, if someone has an eye that honest, it means that you easily see the things that people do for you. Yeah, you easily see things that people do for you. You easily see. You see, every is going to grow up one day, she will not know the things that she's done as a child. She, she will not know the way she's been loved. She will not know the things that have, ha- have happened. Now, many of you, every is going to see you one day and she won't remember that you carried her in church. I don't know whether you are getting me. And that's why sometimes you don't have to get every reason right to honor someone because there are things you will never see, but it's right. You know, it's right. It's right. I think it was Bishop Dagu who was saying something that you know, one day when he was a medical student and he went to pediatrics, the old pediatric emergency, and he saw how the place was, sick children crying, the place was overcrowded, mothers were sleeping in a chair. He came back home and said, oh, I, I, I don't think this is for me, I will not do it again. This medical school thing, I won't do it again. And his mother told him that, listen, I slept with you at that emergency many days. But he, he, he didn't know. I stayed in that emergency with you many nights. You you see, we don't have to give you the many sacrifices that have been done in secret that you don't know about before you honor. But respect the wisdom of the one who commanded you to do it. Hallelujah. You don't know the many things that were transferred to you. The, the The many doors that opened for you because of fathers. You don't know. You don't know. So we do it because it's right. Number two. Have an eye that honest. The eye that honest means that you see the positive things the person has done. The eye that honest will leave the negatives. Will leave. I'm not saying the negatives don't exist too. There are times that the negatives help you relate to the person well because you don't put yourself in a position where you are abused. But the eye that honest will see the positives they've done for you. Number three, honor the Lord with your substance. And with the first fruit of your increase. There is a way to honor. You honor with your substance. Anna, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about your parents. Some of you should be thoughtful enough. It's not about the amount. You give back. Yes. It's not all the time. I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. Even if it's diary, buy it for your dad. You honor with your substance. And when we say substance, money is the list of things when it comes to substance, so money is the least. Every resource that you have, you honor someone with you. I don't know whether you are getting what I'm saying. You honor. You are their disposal. The lady say, when you go home, cook for your fathers to eat. Hey, hallelujah. Or those who don't have fathers, your mothers. Or the father, I'm not saying father figures be cooking can't come for them. No. But I'm saying that honor with your substance. With your energy, be available. I don't know whether you are getting me. And when it's money, to honor with money. 
Because it's something that you have. It's one of the things that you have. Honor with money. Honor the Lord with your substance. And the first fruit. God is like a father figure in your life. He's a father in your life. Then you have father figures. Honor them. I'm not also talking about transactional relationships where fathers only relate better with you when you sow a seed. I mean, many of you here, you know I relate to you. It's not about how much you are going to give to me. No way. I relate with my fathers too. It's not about how much I give to them, but there is a place of honoring with your substance. When you have money in your hands, what do you think of? What comes to mind? What comes to your mind when, when you get money in your hands? You must think of honoring with your substance. If you have the ability to do something or make something happen, do it. Make it happen. If you have a means of facilitating something, facilitate it. If you can make their lives easier, make their lives easier. Serve. Honor the Lord. The, one say, Anna, you, the way to honor is to give substance. And substance is not money alone. It's every other thing you have. Money is one of the things you have. You can honor with your life. You can honor with your strength. You can honor with your connections and the relationships you have, you have developed. I remember one of my, my fathers. I told him, is there anything I can do to make your life easier? It's one of the questions to ask. When you go home, few days or even from here, ask. When you meet fathers, is there anything I can do to make your life easier? There were people I was ironing for if it will make your life easier. There were people I was, you know, maybe I can take care of A, B, C, D so that you can focus on the other things. That's the way to honor. Hey, Hallelujah. Seek the audience of your fathers. Yes. Be excited to talk to them. Don't let, you know, the calls are when they call, say, oh, one day you, it will never ring. For the past close to three years now, 0242222236 has never rang on my phone. A day will come when that number will never call. Sometimes, some of us make it look bad in some. As if our relationship with fathers, like they are worrying you be. No. You rather should seek their audience. Pastor, can I speak to you? I want something. I know you are busy, but you know, can, can, let me know a free time. I want to come and see you. I relate with my fathers like that. I'm not telling you to do something I don't do myself. I told you I woke up at dawn. I slept very late last night. But I woke up this dawn. I went to see a father. Hey, I, I don't know whether you are getting me. And maybe the final thing I'll say on this, on this subject See, learn to ask questions about things you probably even have answers to already, especially when it comes to fathers. There are some things I already have answers to them, but I ask fathers anyway. Yes. You know what you want to do. It's not like you are ignorant, you are dumb. You are not ignorant, you are not dumb, but you still ask. You see, look at the way Jesus related to his father. It was like Jesus didn't have a mind of his own. Every day my father, every day my father, every day my father has said, every day my father has said, my father has said, my father has said. It's an important thing. Listen, so much wisdom would be dispensed to your life when you know how to properly relate with fathers. And one of them is through conversations. Ask questions. And anytime you ask anyone questions, what you are telling the person is that I respect your wisdom. That's what you are telling the person. It's like when I'm asking Gabriel your opinion about something, what do you think we should do about this thing? in the church? It means I respect you. It means I rate your, your, your thinking. It means if I ask Pastor Christopher to do something or Akosia to do something or Lady Pastor or anyone to do something, it's because I've put a certain premium on them. And one of the ways to honor fathers is to seek their audience and listen to them. Finally, is to obey them. You see, when I ask you to do something you don't do, normally next time, I'm not motivated to tell you to do anything. When a father asks you to do anything, do it so well. I don't know whether you are getting me. When they give you an instruction, you don't need a person to come back to say it again. Some of you have been asked to wash bowl. Three hours later, I say, hey, won't you wash the bowl? That's a bad sound. See, immediately the person speaks, it's like your word is my command. Whenever the person speaks, you get to work immediately. Please, I hope you are getting me. If we can do this, the hearts of fathers will be turned to us. You know, the other part that says that fathers do not provoke your children. It's also there. But today I'm not talking to the fathers. I'm talking to the children. We, we, we are going to do our part. And we are going to trust God. 
to make our fathers also do their parts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Oh, be on your feet with me. 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 You know, Proverbs chapter 15 verse 20 says that a wise son makes a glad father. Bring joy to your parents. I don't know whether you are getting me. To your fathers. Like, let your father see your life and be happy what you have made out of your life. Bring joy to the hearts of your fathers. Bring joy. A wise son would what? Make a glad father. A wise son makes a glad father. Finally, before we leave here, the story of the prodigal son has two aspects. The prodigal son knew something about the father his elder brother didn't know. He said, I will arise. I will go back to my father's house. He knew that somehow his father has compassion. His father would accept him. And then there was the, old, uh, the elder brother who was right there in that house. Right? But look at the attitude he had. When he was coming back and he heard his father had accepted his brother, the Bible said he was angry he would not come in. You know? And then he said, how many, how many times have you given me a little goat to even celebrate with my, my friends? And his father said something that was instructive. He said, all that I have is yours. Why is that important? It's important because people have everything and don't know it. You can be that elder brother who is transactional in their relationship, which is, I have worked for you. I have done all these things for you. You have not done this for me. And there are many people who are here in, in their mind, my father has not done this for me. Whilst they have everything, oh, like he said, everything I have is yours. But he was there asking for a little goat. There are people today who are waiting to be given goats when they own everything. You see, when you have a proper relationship with a father, everything that is yours, you would know. It is shocking that after how many years before you have been told that everything I have is yours and you think that I've been working so hard for you, you have not given me. You have not given me. Listen. I pray that this church will not be like the elder brother. Yes, the elder brother's mindset. The younger brother knows that even if I mess up, my father has his hands stretched out to receive me. And then the elder brother didn't know that I have a relationship. And I'm saying it because one of the important relationships you must get right is your relationship with your heavenly father. Yes, your heavenly father. I don't know what, how many people have a need here? You have a need for a goat to do some pepper soup with your friends. And you said, oh God, look at all the times I've served you, the things I've done in your house, the prayers I've prayed, and you've not even given me some one million to chill with my friends over a weekend. Today, the word that is coming from the Father is that, Gabriel, all that I have is yours. Dede, all that I have is yours. Wisdom, all that I have is yours. So I, I want you to pray this morning quickly. Our time is a bit past. But I want you to pray this morning in about a minute. And, and, and ask God for grace. Anything that has turned your heart away from the fathers. Pray that you would be united in heart with the fathers. God is one of the father figures in our lives. So if anything drives your heart away from him, that thing has taken you away from your source. So pray that your heart will be united with the Father's heart once again. And also pray for your earthly fathers, for those who have lost their parents. Ask that, oh God, those who you have put on my journey to represent fathers, may I come across them. May I come across them in the name of Jesus. May I come across them in the name of Jesus. Some of you are yet to meet people who represent fathers in your life. Some of you are yet to meet them. But pray that you will meet them very soon. People who represent and pour into your life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We thank you for opening our eyes through the scriptures. Help us give proper honor to our fathers. 
our physical fathers, the people who are supposed to represent you in our lives. And we pray that our eyes will be open to see the other people you have put on our journey who are supposed to represent you in our lives. We give you praise. We give you honor. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Put your hands together. Thank you for listening to the sermons of Reverend Dr. Albert Agbi. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Edify Church Life. Listen to more of his sermons on our Telegram at Edify Sermons and Edify Church Spotify platforms. Thanks for being a part of our Edify Church family. Be blessed by this word of God.